All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. We are going to be today exploring spoken word poetry. Um, this is a form of poetry that I find students um, respond to more because it is contemporary. All the poems you're watching have been done in the last couple of years. And um, also, a lot of these poems are extremely powerful. So we'll talk about what spoken word poems are. And then I'll go through um, a couple of them that I'd like you to watch, and I'll talk about um, what poetic elements I want you to look for while you're watching the poem, so things to, um, in particular, things to observe. I have a folder for you guys with a lot more poems than just the ones that I'll talk about today, and that's really just so that they're sort of optional viewing. If you want to watch them um, and you kind of get into this <laughs> this type of poetry, you're more than welcome to. So what is spoken word? Um, spoken word is literary performance art. So it's a combination of the poem itself and the way that the person chooses to perform the poem typically characterized by rhyme, repetition, improvisation, and wordplay. A lot of the repetition has to do with the fact that this is an oral form. So there are, um, the girl in the picture there has a um, sheet that she's reading from, but for the most part, people are memorizing these things. The other reason is that repetition they use to kind of build tension to reinforce their themes or their message, um, as well as remind the audience of some of the things that the audience has heard. In terms of the rhyme, um, because it's not on a page, we're not talking here as we did before about whether this is internal rhyme or end rhyme and even what the rhyme scheme would look like, right? But it's just um, something that can affect the ears of the listener. Spoken word poems are often intensely personal. So we've talked a lot about how the poem and the speaker are two different things. The poet, sorry, and the speaker are two different things. The speaker is a persona that the poet puts on. Sometimes in spoken word poetry, the poem and the speaker are one and the same. That's one of the very few types of poetry where this occurs. Another type is called confessional poetry, um, which is a different sort of subgenre of poetry. It can also have a political, and I, so, I sometimes say a global message. So um, sometimes it's actually political, and one of at least one of the poems that we're going to be looking at today is um, more of a political poem, and they're trying to make a political statement. But other times, it, it's more of a universal message in the same way that some of the short stories and certainly the plays um, would have contained. Frequently, these poems refer to issues of social justice, politics, race, and community. They're, it's related to slam poetry, and sometimes spoken words are performed um, in slam poetry um, not was sometimes competitions, I guess, but events is what the word I'm looking for. Spoken word poetry can draw on music, sound, dance, and other types of performance. Um, I think that I have linked for you guys one of the ones that involves dance. That's not one of the ones I'll talk about in this presentation, but it's sort of interesting the way that she moves those two things together. Some of the influences on spoken word. The, the genre really has its roots in oral traditions and performance as well as theater. So oral poetry is an ancient art form. We talked about this a little bit when I went through the types of poetry. A lot of the epics started out as oral poetry, things that were passed down, stories that are passed down throughout a culture. In many cultures, oral poetry overlapped with or could have been also song. Now we kind of look at songs and poems as two separate things, um, but in spoken word poetry, they sort of come closer together and those, those borders become almost indistinct. In some cultures, oral poetry is also performed by other means, um, such as the talking drums in some African cultures. So you can see a picture of one of them there. 
Spoken word also has its roots, um, it has its roots in these oral traditions, but there was a lot of personal and political poetry during the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. We're going to be looking at one of those poems, as well as the beat generation in the 1950s. So this idea of poetry as protest, um, and I'll show you a poem from the beat generation, and we'll kind of talk about both of those poems in the way that they're sort of similar to some of the spoken word poetry you'll be watching. The music of those decades influenced this art form as well. Jazz, blues, folk music, and a little bit into um, rock and roll. By the 1980s, spoken word really started to emerge more um, because of things like rap and hip hop. And interestingly enough, even stand up comedy. So one of the poems that I picked for you, I picked because you can really see how stand up comedy and, and the, the influence of um, telling jokes and having good timing, <laughs> um, how that kind of plays a part in her poem. But really, the rap and hip hop culture, where a lot of songs sort of become poems, poems become songs. We're going to look at a poem um, by a hip hop artist in a little bit, and we'll talk about how, oh, sorry, we'll talk about how he kind of blends music and poetry together. American poet Mark Smith is credited with starting the Poetry Slam um, in November 1984. And in 1990, the first national one took place in Fort Mason, San Francisco. Russell Simmons um, and Most Deaf <laughs> um, hosted, produced and then hosted Deaf Poetry from 2002 to 2007, which was on... Um, HBO. For, so f some of the poems that we're looking at are a little bit older because they come from this particular show. But it really helped to make this more popular and kind of um, throughout the nation. So Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance really occurred because you had um, in the 1920s, we talked about F. Scott Fitzgerald and other um, modern writers. And during this time, you had a lot of African-Americans move up from the South um, to the North looking for opportunities. And many became quite prosperous. And because of that, um, in Harlem, you had this really rich, beautiful culture um, where artists and writers, there we go. I like that the guy is clearly checking out these two, these two women. Um, you have a lot of um, artists and writers and um, musicians all in a very small space. And so they start really influencing each other. And as I've talked about before, music and art and literature often have these similar movements because it's almost as if these people are in a dialogue. So we're going to take a look at a poem by Langston Hughes. It's called The Ballad of the Landlord. And it's all in um, one long form. I've broken it up into two just because of how the screen goes. So, landlord, landlord, my roof has sprung a, sprung a leak. Don't you remember I told you about it way last week? Landlord, landlord, these steps is broken down. When you come up yourself, it's a wonder you don't fall down. Ten bucks you say I owe you? Ten bucks you say is due? Well, that's ten bucks more and I'll pay you till this house, till you fix this house up new. What? You got eviction orders? You gonna cut off my heat? You gonna take my furniture and throw it in the street? Uh-huh, you talking high and mighty till... Talk till you get through. You ain't going to be able to say a word if I lay my fist on you. Police, police, come get this man. He's trying to ruin the government and overturn the land. Copper's whistle, pa patrol bell, arrest, precinct station, iron cell, headlines in press. Man threatens landlord, tenant held no bail. Judge gives Negro 90 days in county jail. So here, I think it's kind of interesting because it's almost a dialogue. Um, you can see, whoops, <laughs> now you can't. Um, you can see right here where the split comes. So the first part is the tenant talking to his landlord, then the landlord talks, and then it goes into this almost third person idea. Um, but jazz definitely influenced this poem. It's called a ballad and it has a distinct rhythm for the first 
one, two, three, four, five stanzas. The rhythm changes slightly. I know I'm tripping over my words a little bit here, so maybe you couldn't hear the rhythm as I was reading it. I apologize for that. Um, the the rhythm almost keeps up. Um, instead of landlord, landlord, we have police, police, right? And then the rhythm changes in the last stanza. The idea here, though, is that this is not necessarily about Langston Hughes, but there is a political message here in some parts um, of New York City and possibly in Harlem, although a lot of people who lived there had a little bit more money, as you can kind of see from their clothing in the picture. Um, but in other places in New York City, you had these slumlord tenements and um, they were trying to get money from people without, you know, doing their job and fixing the place up. That still happens in some places now, but now we have a little bit more protection for tenants um, and they can, you know, report people for um, violations and that kind of thing. Um, but I think that you you can get a really clear... Um, a really clear image of what's going on with this situation and how he's trying to create a conversation and move beyond some of the typical themes of poetry that we saw in some of the movements before. So previously, you know, we talked um, with short stories about romanticism and transcendentalism and, and things like that. And he's not writing about nature or love or just his personal experiences, right? He's trying to get out a political message. I particularly like the, the capitalization there in the last three lines. It's also, if you notice, the structure changes. So we have four lines, four lines, four lines, four lines, four lines, four lines, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Nine. So it's more than double the other stanzas to kind of show um, I can talk a little bit, my landlord can talk a little bit, but ultimately the... Um, you know, the government and the process takes over. Man threatens landlord without giving the other side. The other thing that he's trying to do is show that minority point of view. And it would really have been a minority point of view at that time. There were not a lot of African-American writers um, and there were fewer who were... Um, Except, except in Harlem during this time where, where you kind of have this renaissance. So a lot of people in this time, like Lance, Langston Hughes and other writers, um, are trying to describe the non-dominant American experience. So rather than telling the story from the landlord's point of view, from the cop's point of view, from the judge's point of view, um, from a, you know, a standard American um, white person's point of view, you have a unique um, experience to that person's culture. Beat poetry arises a little bit later. Here's a picture of some of the beat poets. Um, and again, you're talking about small circles of people, right? So beat poetry, um, a lot of that sort of was in, yeah, <laughs> there it is. Um, a lot of beat poetry would have been read out loud. So you get some of the performance elements here. And I have these two pictures because um, this is a group of the beat poets in the 1950s. You can see Allen Ginsberg, who we're going to be reading in a moment, um, with a very young Bob Dylan and two other authors whose names I cannot remember right now. Apologies. And this is kind of the dominant culture of the time, right? Um, that idea of conformity that comes after the um, the Second World War and the, the image of... Um, you know, we, we meet at the soda fountain after the sock hop, right? That kind of thing. The beat poets are also minority voices in many ways. Um, Allen Ginsberg, who we're going to be reading in a second, was Jewish in a largely Christian culture. And so a lot of their poetry is coming, again, from a marginalized place, much like the poems in the Harlem Renaissance. These are writers who are pushing against the dominant culture to kind of develop a culture of their own. So this is Howell by Allen Ginsberg. Um, this is not all of Howell. It's quite a long poem, but uh, it's a portion. 
I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night, who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz who bared their brains to heaven under the L and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenement roofs illuminated, who passed through universities with radiant, cool eyes, hallucinating Arkansas and Blake Light tragedy among the scholars of war, who were expelled from the academies for crazy and publishing obscene odes on the windows of the skull, who cowered in unshaven rooms and underwear, burning their money in wastebaskets and listening to the terror through the wall who got busted in their public beards, returning through Laredo with a belt of marijuana for New York, who ate fire in paint hotels or drank turpentine in Paradise Alley, death or purgatory their torsos night after night. And it goes on from there. They were really influenced by Walt Whitman, who, depending on um, when you're taking this class, we may or may not have looked at him, um, this idea of free verse. But one of the things that is... um, comparable to the beat uh, I'm sorry to the beat poets the beat poets is comparable to the spoken word poetry that you're going to be really studying um, is that you can see that he's not shying away from difficult subjects here and he's talking about people being um, in poverty and sitting up hollow eyed and smoking and contemplating jazz and um burning for a fix, right? So they're drug addled and they're addicted and they are um, in unshaven, unshaven in their underwear, burning their money in wastebaskets, um, meaning, you know, d- doing drugs, listening through the tears through the wall as other people also get high or um, are you know, later on, he describes some, some more sexual things as well. So this idea of, um, in the first poem that we just looked at from the Harlem Renaissance, really trying to express the the minority experience and a different view of America, and also have uh, having a political message kind of in a narrative um, was the the Harlem Renaissance poem. In this poem, I think what you can take from it is uh, talking about things that we're not supposed to talk about, um, using very strong imagery. And I read it in some parts quickly because that's what a lot of spoken word poetry does. It speeds up and it slows down. And certainly when this poem is performed, um, that is something that occurs as well. And having strong imagery that, again, is describing scenes that might not be the prettiest. And eventually, um, this is him describing various friends of his, but eventually we also have... um, a more political or universal message later on in the poem. So similar to these poems, spoken word poetries often sound like music or are combined with music. You'll notice both of these, um, you know, the first one is written in the jazz age. The second one, you know, that kind of weird contemporary jazz that doesn't have really a melody. It's kind of written like that. Um, similarly, um, spoken word poems often, as I said, have a global message and a, or a universal message and a personal message. They're diverse and they're interested in depicting the unique experiences of the individual. Um, Howell goes into a lot more very specific things. Um, Allen Ginsberg was also, or is, I think also a homosexual as well as being Jewish. So, um, In the same way, spoken word poems are interested in that. So look for that diversity. Look for um, people who are marginalized, people who are in the minority and their alternative point of view. Their examples, the speaker and the poet, may be one and the same. They contain structural repetition. They have rhythms that are dependent on speed, much as as I should say rhythm in music. Um, not necessarily just the beat, but the speed in which they um, are talking. They often inc- have diction that may include slang or cursing. 
Um, I've taught some of these in class before, and because of that, um, some people got offended and walked out. And they're dependent on performance elements, such as body language, vocal changes, facial expressions, and movement. So you really do have to pay close attention to how these people are moving. Daniel Beatty, when he does knock knock, he pumps his fist as if knocking on a door. Um, the Scorpio Blues, when she does second guessing, she's crouching sometimes, she's moving around, she's acting out some of the things that she's talking about. Um, the three girls who do changing the world one word at a time um, sometimes are just standing and when they do have a movement with their hands or their arms, it's very important to watch because it's supposed to be kind of adding again to the meaning. So some of the things to listen for in all of these poems, the power of spoken word, um, rhythm and changes to rhythm. Look at where people speed up, look where they ch slow down, um, look where they go on beat, look where they go off beat. Why are they doing those things? Musical elements, we'll talk about some of those in some of the poems, but really all of them have almost a musical quality because of things like alliteration, assonance, and consonance. If you remember, alliteration is the repetition of a letter at the beginning of words. Consonance is the repetition of that letter in any word. Assonance is the repetition of a vowel sound rhyme and because um you know because these are spoken we're not really again talking about internal rhyme and or you know end rhyme or whatever but listen for rhyme and listen for some of the the sound effects that make it more musical repetition as i mentioned before playing with words having puns using a word one way um daniel Beatty's poem that i just mentioned knock knock has um he asks about dribbling a ball and then he talks about dribbling words off of a pen so why use that particular word right some interesting diction and again some slang cursing and sometimes improvisation i think you can see some improvisation um in kanye west's poem especially at the beginning before he begins to um actually rehearse the poem so specifically changing the world one word at a time um is a poem by three girls who at the time were in high school and the speakers of the poem describe the lessons that aren't taught in school the ways in which institutions fail the teenagers they're meant to protect this is for all of these, I'm giving you a very brief overview because I don't want to tell you too much about the content of the poem. So it's it's a gross oversimplification um, for me to say that um, that's what this poem is about because I think there's a lot more to it. You can see in the picture I've got the performance elements, you know, how they have their hands all in the same um, space. So things to look for. The, there are three speakers Sometimes, uh, this poem really, they, they are using personas, so it's not necessarily exactly their experiences. But the perspectives here are somewhat personal. Um, really, they're rep representing larger issues. What I would like you to watch for are places where um, there are a couple times when these two girls speak um, that this girl on the end is silent. I know her name is Melissa and that's Rhiannon and I can't remember the middle girl's name. So I'm sorry about that. Um, escapes me at the moment. But there's times when she speaks when they are silent and there's other times when they each take a line or two, and then there's times when they all talk together. So think about why they're doing that. Why does the speaker shift? Um, how are they all giving three different perspectives that kind of are related? Illusions, um, they refer to several historical events, and there is a lot of controversy in the comment section on YouTube about the accuracy of how they're depicting these events. But what I really want you to watch for is just um, what um, what illusions they're making and then again how they kind of add to the theme. The conflict here is really man versus society. We don't always have conflict narrative or characters in a poem. Um, here we don't exactly have characters, but what we do have are um, descriptions of the way that people are oppressed by society. So that's one of the main themes to look for. Microcosm we have not talked about before, and I want you to know this term when watching this poem. Microcosm is a community, place, or situation regarded as which in miniature 
shows the features of something larger. So a lot of times this will happen in novels. If you think about like Harry Potter, the school and what's going on with um, people there kind of represents the, the larger issues of the wizarding world, <laughs> as strange as that seems to talk about here. Um, other stories about school kind of do the same. And here, when they talk about school, they're really trying to show how that's a microcosm that reflects the problems in the government or the United States as a whole. Also repetition, so watch when things are repeated for emphasis structurally. That is something that they do. Um, and the themes, poverty, racism, censorship, intolerance. What are they trying to say about these things? To be honest with you, I kind of hate breaking down these poems because I think in some ways you should just like watch them and enjoy them. But I do want you to think about a few of the elements. I, if I were you, I would watch them through um, once just to enjoy them, and then you can watch them again before you go to write about them. So second guessing, Scorpio Blues, that's her... Um, her pseudonym, her pen name. Scorpio Blues describes the emotions and actions she goes through when she begins to suspect her significant other is cheating. Things to look for. Her rhythm is on point. <laughs> so she speeds up in some places, particularly when she's describing some of the actions that she's uh, doing for this guy um, or trying to figure out whether or not he is cheating. Other times, she slows down and really punctuates her words. And I've had a couple of people tell me that they had to watch this a few times because it's hard to tell what she's saying because she goes so quickly. And then also the crowd uh, starts applauding as well. I picked this poem for you, though, because the tone really is lighter and because of the way that she performs the poem. We have hyperbole, which is humor, uh, the exaggeration, rather. Um, here, hyperbole is being used for emphasis, but really also for humor as well. Her tone is quite lighter. It's serious in some places, but it's sort of meant to be self-depreciating, like you're laughing at yourself because you know how ridiculous you're being. At the end, she does have a message, though, so watch for that shift in tone. And as I said, what is the story and how is she acting it out? Really, you can see, I put here, the poem seems to have its roots in stand-up comedy, and that may be the case, but there is a message, so I would like you to kind of consider that, what that message might be. It's about second-guessing yourself and your partner and floundering with self-esteem, finding peace in the midst of doubt. Those are some of the themes. Um, consider what her message is and what she's trying to say about those themes. I think, you know, there is sort of a universal message here, but it, it is interesting the way she kind of uses herself and her own story. OCD. That's poet Neil Hilborn. Um, Neil Hilborn describes how his obsessive compulsive disorder destroyed his relationship. I just want to tell you, um, this was a couple years ago, and he's okay now, and he just got married and put on Twitter, hey guys, sorry for all those sad poems about how love sucks and how real love uh, can't happen. Um, but this is a really powerful poem, and I think there's a lot here about mental illness and how it affects the person with it, how it affects those around him, as well as another poem we're going to be looking at in a minute that kind of have similar themes. So performance elements, sometimes um, he acts off, he acts out certain parts, like turning the lights on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off. One point he grabs the top of his head as if trying to make these thoughts cease. There's a couple places where he stomps his foot on the ground. It, the tone really changes and so does the mood of the audience. So at the beginning it's loving and sweet and then he becomes more and more devastated. So look for where the turning point of the poem or the climax of this narrative is. It does have a narrative. I know that's not on here, but it does. He is telling a story with a beginning, middle, and end. So where is the climax? What is the resolution? And where is that shift in tone? His imagery is kind of interesting, and he doesn't have um, as much as some of the other poets that we're looking at. But one of the things, um, and this is something someone pointed out this semester um, as I'm recording it, his 
they, he talks about what his girlfriend does rather than what she looks like. So you can really see that the importance and the emphasis is placed on who this person is rather than just her appearance. And that kind of goes to the depth of emotion and the depth of feeling he has for her. Structurally, because he's describing obsessive behaviors, he repeats things over and over. But how does he use that repetition to build tension and emotional impact? He is showing what his disorder is like, but he's also using that repetition for a, a bigger, um, ow, sorry, to have a bigger impact. Themes are love, heartbreak, melancholy, the impact of mental illness. This is a very personal story to him. The poet and the the speaker are really, um, if they're not exactly the same, then he is a wonderful actor. I have to say that. Um, consider the political message. It, it does, His story does have larger universal implications. So that's something I'd like you to think about. Self-conscious by Kanye West. Um, Kanye talks about self-consciousness and insecurity and how it affects people in the African-American community. Hip-hop as an influence. Sometimes he recites the poem like a poem and other times he sings. Um, what's really interesting about Kanye, even though some pe he's kind of a controversial figure, um, he does say things that seem idiotic. I will remind people that he does have bipolar disorder and he is a mental illness. And that's sort of the reason that that happens sometimes. Having said that, um, he writes poetry that then later sometimes he turns into song. Sometimes he writes songs and then reworks them into poems. So as an artist, he and as a writer, he's quite interesting um, blending these two um, these two genres and crossing boundaries between literature and music that I think is sort of fascinating. But I also picked this poem for you because it's a really good example of a poet putting on a persona. When he comes out on stage, he is improvising, he's acting and performing, but it is part of the poem. So the stuttering in particular, some of the things, uh, stammering is when you repeat a word, watch for some of those things. Characterization, I don't have a lot there and I wish I put more. He describes himself, but also um, after he's describing himself, the persona describes himself, the character in the poem. Um, he also describes an unnamed girl and he goes into quite a bit of her life and how insecurities have affected her life and being self-conscious has affected her. Diction, a lot of slang. And at one point, I won't say where, but he starts to pronounce things in kind of a unique way and putting a lot of emphasis on the way that he's pronouncing them. So think about why he's using that pronunciation. There are a lot of allusions in this poem. Um, Versace, Air Jordans, Lexus, um, he makes um, an important allusion to 40 acres, which was the promise given to former slaves that they would have 40 acres and a mule once they were... Um, set free as reparation. This asserted the right of newly freed African Americans to the redistributed lands, particularly plantations confiscated by U.S. troops after the war. And a few people received this, but for the most part did not happen, right? So he talks about that. So the themes here, um, self-esteem, freedom, institutional racism and how it affects people, but particularly materialism and the connection between materialism, freedom, and racism. How are people entrapped by wanting material things and being self-conscious when they don't have those material things? Knock, knock. Whew, man. Um, this is an extremely powerful poem. So Kanye's poem and Scorpio Blue's poem have a little bit of humor. Um, this is really more, um, it has more of a passionate tone. Daniel Beatty tells the story of his father's imprisonment and the impact it had on his life. Structural repetition and motif, knock, knock, is repeated 
We also have, as I said, how to how to shave, how to dribble a ball, how to walk like a man, and then BD's answers to each one of these lessons. So watch for that parallelism in the structure. The tone begins on a slightly lighter note and then increases in intensity. So really the turning point in this narrative is where BD visits the prison. The poem might seem angry, but the mood and the tone are really, I think, disconnected a bit because I have found that the mood of the audience, the people hearing it, the emotional atmosphere is just really, um, it's inspiring. Um, the poem is inspiring. That's the mood. But the tone um, at times seems angry. And I would maybe, I don't think it's so much anger as it is being passionate and determined. And I would say that's sort of what the tone is there. A lot of imagery in the beginning of the poem, particularly regarding the trip and the visit to prison, as well as the life lessons. And I, th what's interesting, you know, the, the rest of it is sparse on imagery. So really pay attention to those descriptions. Um, what words is he using to describe um, where he's going? Symbolism. Think about the knocking and what it symbolizes. It transforms from a game in childhood until something else. There's also some symbolism in the imagery, as I mentioned before. So kind of going beyond just what knock knock represents. The themes of this poem are about being a son, being a father, having an absent father, really becoming a man and making your own opportunities. So think about his political message is Again, it's a narrative about his life, but with larger implications. All right. Sorry, I'm not sure quite what happened there. Um, explaining my depression to my mother, Sabrina Benaim describes her frustration in trying to explain her depression to her mother. I think that this poem and this story are very is very similar to um, OCD by Neil Hilborn. So look for the similarities between that poem and this, particularly the tone. They have both almost like a nervous energy buzzing through their bodies while they're, you know, while they're performing the pieces. So things to look for here. One of the great things about this poem is her use of metaphor and simile. I don't want to ruin those for you, so I'm not listing them. Look for like, look for as, look for when she says depression is blank, anxiety is blank. Um, just watch for those because, man, she rattles them off. And a lot of poets are told not to mix their metaphors, meaning don't have one metaphor and then another. But she mixes them and it works because she's trying to come up with ways to describe what this experience is like. Right. So using any imagery she can, basically. Um, I'm sorry, any metaphors or similes she can to kind of express that experience. One of the things that sometimes people don't pick up on is that she, in one spot, is talking about her grandmother's funeral. So she says, the flicker of a candle, um, I hate candles, <laughs> because the flicker of a candle, and I am nine years old, I am standing beside her casket. This is... Um, a, a, a candle sparks this memory. So there are other types of sensory experiences that she has as she goes through depression and anxiety and some of the memories that she has that are not so pleasant. So watch for that. The symbolism of these extrasensory experiences, um, I'm sorry, her external sensory experiences. So what she describes hearing, seeing, touching, how is that connected to her inner life? How does it represent things in her inner life? Personification is extremely important here. Depression and anxiety take on human characteristics. They're almost like two other characters in the poem. The other characters obviously being her and her mother. I think too, and I don't have it here, but in terms of characterization, it's very clear that her mother loves her and is trying her best, right? The frustration comes that um, her mother can't understand and honestly 
Neither can she. She doesn't know why she feels this way. And she doesn't know how to make it stop. So ostensibly, this p- poem is about, on the surface, about her personal experience with her mother. The larger a- message here is about the frustration of mental illness, how it affects family, the importance of understanding those who struggle with depression. Again, a lot of themes that are similar to Neil Hilborn's OCD, but done in a, in a totally different way, I think. There we go. Okay. I put a box and I didn't see the words there. So to this day, um, Shane Kazakan describes his experiences being bullied as a child. Now, you'll notice that I had images of all the other people performing. The version that I'm giving you of this has been, um, it's there's an animated sort of movie playing over the top or a film playing over the top of him performing the poem. And um, the images and the music just make it that much more powerful. So that's something to look for. Um, As I said at the bottom here, things to look for. Consider the images, how they demonstrate or reinforce concepts, symbols, characters, and narrative elements of the poem. The structure... Um, it's interesting here because we have one speaker, but we have three different subjects. So sometimes he's talking about himself and the speaker and the poet are the same. Other times he's talking about two other people and sort of narrating their experiences. The poet um, makes parallels between their shared experiences. And I'd like you to see how he sets each one up kind of the same way and then brings all three together. OK, him and his two friends. Metaphor. There is a direct comparison here between the bullied children and the freaks at the circus. Um, Adopted boy is compared to a branch grafted onto a tree that it doesn't necessarily belong to. There's a lot of similes and metaphors throughout the poem. Again, I don't want to give too much away. The repetition of to this day, um, what does that come to mean and symbolize? This poem, the tone of it, um, again, I don't have this listed, but the tone is incredibly serious. It's incredibly um, sad. This is like someone having PTSD almost because of these experiences. So know that going into it. But for the most part, I, I don't want to talk anymore about it. It's a really amazing piece and it's quite powerful. And so are the other poems in this set as well as some of the other ones that I've linked for you that we just don't have enough time where because I could talk about spoken word poems for lectures and lectures and lectures and things to look for um there's a lot more in this uh, in each one of these that I didn't talk about but I kind of want you to discover those for yourselves so I really truly look forward to reading your responses about these and I hope that um these poems can can sort of help to inspire you and maybe maybe if you hated the rest of the poetry (laughs) you'll like at least one of these. So that's it. Thanks.